Hello there, YouTube and Tumblr. It has been such an unjustifiably long time since my last deck tech, and I am sorry about that. But we're going to get right into it. We're going to hopefully get back into the swing of things, and this channel will be as active as it used to be. And it looks like we're probably going to be just a touch askew. But that's fine, because so is this deck. Because you may remember a little while ago I uploaded a video, probably a couple of years ago now, um, talking about a Maelstrom Wanderer EDH deck I made. Uh, and I've sort of revisited it with a larger card pool, a better knowledge of the game, and uh, more experience with deck building. And I think I've made a deck that keeps the spirit of the old one alive uh, and just has a bit more focus and is better at what it does. So, uh, Maelstrom Wanderer is sort of a notorious commander uh, for fun. Oh, I'm sorry. For 8 mana, 5, a blue, a red, and a green, you get a 7-5 that gives all of your creatures haste, and you get to Cascade twice. So when you cast this spell, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card that costs less, and then you may cast that without paying its mana cost. And then you put all of the exiled cards onto the bottom of your library in a random order, then do it again. Uh, so it's a great time. Uh, it's really easy to be abused, uh, which is why this has become a little bit notorious. Uh, most people who build this deck load it up with six and seven drops, big ass creatures, uh, things that are difficult to deal with, um, and they just focus on ramping really hard and then casting their commander, and away you go. You start dropping six drops and seven drops along with your seven five that gives them haste, and you win through a ridiculously overstuffed board that is hyper aggressive and super fast. And a lot of people don't have a whole lot of fun against Maelstrom Wanderer because this is pure card advantage in three colors that can just go bonkers. That is not the direction I took this deck in. Instead, I wanted to build a deck that was just like the old one, where it sort of focuses more on the Cascade um, as a source of chance, a, a randomness. Uh, it, I don't want to call it a Chaos deck, because this deck absolutely does not play cards like Warp World and uh, Scatterverse and Thieves Auction, because those cards aren't fun. They drag the game on, and nobody really has fun playing against a deck that does that, except for the person playing, and really they just kind of sit there and giggle to themselves because, hey, look, this game is taking three hours and, you know, we're four turns in. Uh, this deck absolutely does not do that. This deck speeds the game up and gives everybody a nice shot to take advantage of what it's doing. Um, it's been a lot of fun playing this. I've been playing it for a couple of weeks now. Um, and, you know what? Let's just get right into it, and you'll get to see what happens. So, uh, for my basic lands, I am running five mountains, five islands, and six forests. I figured I wouldn't bore you with those. Here's the non-basics. We have Mad Blind Mountain. This is the card that lets me stick to the soul of this deck. It is a mountain uh, with the land type. It comes into play tapped. Uh, if you pay a red and you tap it, you can shuffle your library. That's all it does. You can only do that if you have two or more red permanents, but that's not very hard for this deck to do. Um, and it lets you shuffle your deck, which is what I will do if I have the spare mana and I'm not really doing anything else. I'll shuffle my deck before I cast Maelstrom Wanderer, or before I cast anything that cascades, or anything like that. Anything that looks at the top cards of your deck and gives you something from there, which a lot of this deck does that. So having Mad Blind Mountain in here lets me keep it fair, I guess, because this deck could easily be played the other way, um, and I really don't want to do that. I don't want to let myself do that, so I have Mad Blind Mountain to allow me to keep going. The rest of the non-basic lands are pretty straightforward. We have the Towers, Reliquary, and Command. We have a Moss Warp Bridge, because of the Hideaway lands, this is the one with the condition that this deck meets most often. Um, potentially could have run the red one, but probably wouldn't have worked quite as well because I don't actually deal as much damage as you'd think until I win. Uh, we have this land with that word in it. Uh, we have all of the shocks. We have two of these buddy lands because I don't have a Sulphur Falls. I've talked about these before. I love them. We've got two temples. We've got two pain lands. We've got all three of these little new refuges and now we've got some mana rocks we've got 
all three of the Cynics, the Signets, Simic, Izzet, and Gruul. We have a Soul Ring, because this is Commander. We have a Gilded Lotus, because this is Commander. We have a Chromatic Lantern, because this is three-color Commander. We have a Teamer Banner, because this is... I don't know. Uh, and then we have some traditional green Sorcery Ramp. Starting with this one, this is my personal favorite. It is called Recross the Paths. It is a sorcery from Morningtide. For two and a green, you reveal cards from the top of your deck until you reveal a land card. You put that card into play, and then you put the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order. You clash with an opponent, and if you win, you put Recross the Paths back into your hand. So, this is the ramp card that best fits what this deck is trying to do, which is whatever it wants to do. I don't have control over it. You don't have control over it. It just does what it does. So, the deck will give me whatever land it feels like giving me, and then maybe I'll recross, I'll recross the pads again. You never know. Um, super fun ramp spell, super fun to play, super interactive, and that's sort of the point of the deck. So, uh, yeah, definitely a favorite card. Honestly, I'd play it in most green decks just because I love it so much. Cultivate. Pretty straightforward. Template Discovery, which is absolutely bonkers, uh, but I have definitely talked about this before in my Gahiji deck tech. Uh, same principle. Pretty much everyone is going to say yes with this card because by the time you get to this, most of the time you've established that you're not that Maelstrom Wanderer deck. So they don't really mind giving you lands, especially when the first one you go and get is Mad Blind Mountain. Uh, so it ends up ramping you pretty hard. You'll usually get four, maybe six lands off of this, depending on how many people you're playing with. But pretty much everyone will say yes. Uh, you've got some explosive vegetation. Again, really standard. And an exploration. Uh, which is pretty good for the first couple of turns, but it's a little dead when you get into the later game. Depending on how many cards you've drawn. Uh, and then I threw Crufix into this section too, because Crufix is pretty good at ramping you from turn to turn. Um, he can store stupid amounts of mana, turn it colorless as phases change. Uh, that's, that's really about it. Otherwise he's a nice indestructible 4-7 for you. Uh, so you're not going to take a whole lot of trample damage over him on average. So now we have Unexpected Results. This is the card that inspired the first version of this deck. I initially built Maelstrom Wanderer as an Unexpected Results deck. At least that's what I was attempting to do back before I knew how to build decks. Um, so Unexpected Results, you shuffle your library, reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a non-land card, you cast it without paying its mana cost. If it's a land card, you put it into play and put Unexpected Results back in your hand. So, worst case scenario, you get a Recross the Paths. Best case scenario, you get something stupid, and the game gets to continue, and everyone's having fun. And the best part about this card is that first three words, shuffle your library. This is all one trigger, so there's nothing you can possibly do to unexpected results to break it. You can't abuse it. You can't set up for it. You can't scry for it. You're going to get what you're going to get, and that's how the deck's going to run. And that is what I built this deck around. That's the philosophy for this deck. So, getting into other things that do this, Mize Desire is unexpected results with Storm. So, that's all kinds of fun. We have two tutors. We have Signal the Clans, and we have Gamble. They both do similar things. Uh, for Gamble, for one red at sorcery speed, you search your library for a card, put it in your hand, and then discard a card at random. And then you shuffle your deck. Uh, and Signal of the Clans, you search your library for three creature cards and reveal them. If they have different names, you choose one of them randomly and put it into your hand, and the rest gets shuffled into your library. So, uh, keeping with the theme of not really having as much control over this deck as you think you do, um, but it's a lot of fun because it creates a nice sense of suspense. Uh, Wild Evocation is a great card. Five and a red for an enchantment at the beginning of each player's upkeep. That player reveals a card at random from his or her hand, and if it's a land card, that player puts it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, that player casts it without paying its mana cost, if able. So it will force you to cast that card, which could be good or bad. We'll see. Uh, there is only one card in here that that could be a problem, and that's why I put it in here. And we'll get to that later. So, uh, we also have a Bloodbraid Elf and a Shardless Agent. Uh, little things that cascade, just for the fun of it, really. They don't really affect the board state all that much. They're sort of inconsequential creatures. Uh, but they have that cascade in them. And most of the time off of Shardless Agent, you're going to get a Signet. Uh, Blood Braid Elf is usually going to ramp you or something like that. So nothing nothing too crazy. Uh, Rush Me, Eternal's Crafter. Uh, the 2-3 Elf Druid from 
Kaladesh, whenever you cast your first spell each turn, you reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a non-land card with converted mana cost less than that spells, you may cast it without paying its mana cost. And if you don't, you just draw the card. So, worst case scenario, you draw a card. That's pretty good. We have Jalira, Master Polymorphist. Uh, instant speed, polymorph, one of your creatures. Uh, you sacrifice another creature, reveal cards from the top of your deck, till you reveal a non-legendary creature, put the card on the battlefield, and the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order. So... If something's about to die, you can instead turn it into something random that you have no control over because Mad Blind Mountain. Um, goal of this deck, shuffle it a lot, see what happens. And it does not disappoint. Polymorph itself. You destroy a target creature, it can't be regenerated, and its controller reveal cards from the top of their library until he or she reveals a creature card. That player puts that card into play and shuffles all the others revealed this way into their library. Pretty straightforward. Uh, there's a whole deck built around this. It's pretty neat. Chaos Warp, similar idea to Polymorph, uh, except it doesn't always get you something. Uh, most of the time with Polymorph and Chaos Warp, you're going to hit your own stuff, just to see what happens. Salvala Stampede is something out of Conspiracy, Take the Crown, uh, or whatever it ended up being called, I can't remember. Um, Council's Dilemma, starting with you, each player votes for Wild or Free. Uh, for each Wild vote, you reveal cards off the top of your library until you reveal a creature card, and then you put those creatures into the battlefield. And then you shuffle the rest into your library, and you get a permanent card from your hand into play for each free vote. So, that's pretty bonkers. Uh, and the table is generally going to always vote free because they figure what comes out of your hand can't possibly be as bad as what you could uh, pseudo-cascade into. Um, especially have, if you have few cards in hand, so I'd recommend holding this back until you have a full grip or more. Stolen Goods. It's a sorcery for three and a blue. Target opponent exiles cards from the top of his or her library until he or she exiles a non-land card. Until end of turn, you may cast that card without paying its mana cost. None of those cards go back into their deck or into their graveyard. They will stay in exile. So if Stolen Goods hits something that you don't want to cast and that you definitely don't want anybody in this game to have because it would not be fun or it would screw with your deck too much, you can just leave it in exile. Otherwise, you get something for free and you don't know what it is. So, just like the Maelstrom Wanderer. Uh, the Great Aurora is one of those really weird cards. I'm, I'm not entirely sure I want to keep it in here. It's sort of a reset button for the game. Uh, it's a sorcery for nine. Uh, each player shuffles all cards from his or her hand and all permanents he or she owns in his or her library, then draws that many cards, and each player can put any number of land cards from their hand onto, onto the battlefield, and then it exiles itself. So you can't cascade into it because it costs nine. Um, I have yet to cast it. I'm not entirely sure that there's a situation where I would, which is why I say that I'm probably going to take it out, but it seemed to fit pretty well with the deck, so we'll see. It needs more testing. Intet the Dreamer, uh, she's a nice big dude, a 6-6 six, six flyer that you can cascade into, and when she deals combat damage to a player, you can pay two and a blue, exile the top card of your library face down, you can look at it for as long as it remains exiled, and cast it without paying its mana cost for as long as Intet is on the field. So, uh, pretty neat, pretty in line with what Maelstrom Wanderer likes to do, just needs to get a little more aggressive to do it. Reforge the Soul, it's a Wheel of Fortune, it miracles itself, or more often than not, you can cascade into it. Um, draw seven new cards, it's fun. Next up we have See the Unwritten is next. Uh, this is probably my favorite uh, commander card from this entire block. Um, minus, of course, the legends that gave us access to wedges in a way that we didn't have before. Anyway, uh, see that written as a sorcery. You reveal the top eight cards of your library. You can put any creature card from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your graveyard. Or, if you control a creature with power four or greater, you may put two creature cards onto the battlefield instead of one. And this is sort of where you would use Mad Blind Mountain so that you couldn't set yourself up. And you just kind of see what the deck wants to give you. And you just kind of play it that way. And it's a lot of fun. Great card. Absolutely great card. Absolutely bonkers. Killer Instinct is kind of similar. For four, a red and a green, you get an enchantment that says at the beginning of your upkeep, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a creature card, you put it into play, give it haste until end of turn, and then sack it at the end of the turn. So, for one turn, you get some crazy beater, and it comes in at beat's face, kills your opponent. Good time. Possibility Storm. This is the divisive card of the deck. Some decks love it, some decks hate it, some players just cannot decide where they sit. With Possibility Storm, it's an enchantment for 3 and 2 red out of Dragon's Maze. 
uh, whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand. So this doesn't interact with commanders. That player exiles it, then exiles cards from the top of their deck until they exile a card that shares a card type with it. So legendary, creature, artifact, enchantment, planeswalker, sorcery, instant, etc. I mean, tribal, I guess. That player may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then he or she puts all cards exiled with Possibility Storm on the bottom of their deck in a random order. So, nobody gets to control what they're casting. Um, and that's how the game progresses. A lot of decks that have a heavy creature theme or a heavy artifact, artifact decks in particular, hate this card. And I hate artifact decks, so this is perfect. Um, because they'll invest a lot of mana into casting something like a Dark Steel Forge. And out on the other end, they'll get a Demir Signet instead. Which is hilarious to me, because I don't like artifact decks. They're all the same deck, it doesn't matter who the commander is. So unless it's Mishra. Mishra's fun. Anyway, Possibility Storm is a great card. It's really difficult to remove unless somebody has a Crozen Grip, um, or they have to storm into something to kill it. And that's if they want to kill it. A lot of people will dedicate uh, resources to keeping this alive because they're having so much fun with it and their deck is generating a lot of advantage off of it. So, great for the table. All around, great card. A lot of fun. Next up we have Genesis Wave. This is sort of a mono-green staple in Commander. It's a sorcery. It's kind of bad with Maelstrom Wanderer because if you cascade into it, this X is going to be zero. Otherwise, for X and 3 green, you reveal the top X cards of your library. Put any number of permanent cards with converted mana cost X or less from among them onto the battlefield. This includes lands. And you put all the other cards revealed this way that weren't put onto the battlefield into your graveyard. So, you don't really lose anything to exile. Um, your instants and sorceries are going to get skipped over, but that's about it. And in general, if you get that X high enough, which you should, uh, you're going to get some crazy stuff. You're going to load up the battlefield with the top quarter of your deck uh, if you play this right which is just bonkers it sets you up for an amazing next turn or an amazing this turn if you've got the maelstrom wander out and all your creatures have haste next up illusory gains this is a hilarious enchantment from dragons of tarkir um, it is a control magic for three and two blue you enchant a creature you control the enchanted creature but whenever a creature enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, you attach illusory gains to that creature. So whatever the most recent creature is, your opponent's going to get the enter the battlefield trigger, and then you're going to steal it. So this is just a funny card that changes the way people have to play the game. It can change people's minds on whether or not they want to have uh, their commander out, especially if you get a hold of a sack outlet somehow. Uh, you could Jalira at instant speed, for example. Um... It's just, it's funny, it's hilarious. A lot of games have turned into a really weird political uh, thing because of illusory gains, and only illusory gains. Just one little card just makes such a huge difference. It's so much fun to play. I highly recommend it for anyone who wants to have this kind of board presence. Um, and just mess with your friends. It's a lot of fun. Eye of the Storm is next. Eye of the Storm... Um, is a absolutely stupid enchantment from Ravnica City of Guilds for 5 and 2 blue. Uh, whenever a player plays an instant or sorcery card, you exile it. Then that player copies each instant and sorcery card removed from the game with Eye of the Storm. And for each copy, that player may play the copy without paying its mana cost. So, everybody's instants and sorceries for the rest of the game are going to get stacked under Eye of the Storm, and anytime anyone casts an instant or sorcery, they get a copy of all of those instants and sorceries that were thrown under there. Now, you throw a counter spell on there, that's pretty funny. You throw a board wipe on there, or a ramp spell, or if you throw something really stupid under there, um, I don't know what. You get to take your pick from this deck. Let's say, see the unwritten. It just, it goes... Bonkers. I love this card. It always turns into a game ender. Um, you're going to drop this, and if it's not dealt with, eventually someone is just going to go crazy with it. It's going to be whichever deck is best at taking advantage of this. It's just, it's, it's great. I love this card. It's really difficult to play, and it was hard to find a, a deck that wanted it, but so worth it. Uh, Lurking Predators. Uh, this is a relatively recent standout. 
uh, for the commander format. Uh, it's an enchantment for 4 and 2 green from M10. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you reveal the top card of your library, and if it's a creature card, you put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, you can put that card on the bottom of your deck. So, it really incentivizes your opponents playing conservatively. It makes them sort of think twice about what they're going to cast and how badly they want it. Because there are certainly creatures and cards that I put in here to win the game. And they could very easily run into one of those. Um, regardless, if they do hit a creature, for the most part, it's going to be a problem for them. So, this is all around just a really fantastic card. And I'm really excited to see more green decks playing it, because I think it had been overlooked for a very long time. Uh, so here, we have some of the win conditions for the deck. That was sort of the pile of things that go random and do things that you can't control. These are the couple of cards that you're looking for most often. Uh, with World Spine Worm, you can't cascade into it. You just have to find a way to cast it, either off of Lurking Predators or Killer Instinct. However, uh, it is a 15-15 with Trample for 8 and 3 green. When it dies, it turns into 3 five fives with Trample. And when it's put into a graveyard from anywhere, you shuffle it into its owner's library. So, just absolutely bonkers. When I was, in st uh, when I was playing Standard, when this was in Standard, uh, there was an elf deck that was using Possibility Storm and a bunch of mana dorks to get this thing out way too early and just win with it. Funny card. Uh, Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger. Um, if your deck is starving for a win condition, throw in an Ulamog. Uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's a 10 10. It exiles two permanents when you cast it. It's indestructible. And when it attacks, uh, the opponent loses a fifth of their deck. So if you're looking for a bomb in Commander, Ulamog the Ceaseless Hunger is pretty much your go to. It's colorless, it fits in any deck. So that's why it's here. Uh, next up, Avenger of Zendikar. This is also pretty straightforward. You're going to make a bunch of dudes, you're going to pump a bunch of dudes, and you're going to swing with a bunch of dudes. Especially if you get into the late game or you get this off of a Genesis wave, so you have a ton of lands. Um, you just make a bunch of guys, you swing in when they have haste, and away you go. And you can cascade into this, by the way, with Maelstrom Wanderer, so that's a plus. There's a Blightsteel Colossus. Basically the same deal as the Ulamog... If your deck is starving for a win condition and you're a creature deck, Blightsteel Colossus is probably the way to go if you can get a hold of one. It's an 11-11 with Trample, Infect, and Indestructible. And like the World Spine Worm, if it will be put into a graveyard from anywhere, instead you put it in your library. So, pretty straightforward. Basically, this deck just needed a couple of bombs to make sure that something that would stick would cause an immediate issue so that we weren't just sitting there and puking our decks out and then this deck went nowhere. All right, Apocalypse. This is that card I was talking about that um, is sort of the deck's reset button. This is a sorcery for two and three red. You remove all permanents from the game and then discard your hand. Cascading into this is absolutely stupid. Especially if it's the first thing you hit with that Cascade. Because you will cast this. Exile all permanents. Reset the game. Dat back to turn zero. And then you will get a Maelstrom Wanderer. And something else. It's bonkers. It's also a little dangerous. Because you could very easily get it in your hand and then wild evocation it. And there's really nothing you could do about it. Except, you know, pray that somebody has a counterspell if it's not what you want. But... It's important to note that your deck is really good at setting itself up again. Even if it loses a lot of things, if this happens really late game, there's a really good chance that your deck is still going to do pretty well because this is Maelstrom Wanderer and we're good at cheating things out. Also, this is my absolute favorite card in the game, Apocalypse. I want as many of these as possible. Uh, now we're going to kind of get into the rest of the deck. I really don't know what else to call it. Um, it's a bunch of stuff. Um, it doesn't do anything random. It doesn't really play into the theme of, you know, the uncontrolled deck, you know, running rampant, doing what it wants. But it's some pretty good stuff. Uh, good stuff to cascade into, good stuff to drop. So this is a 6-6 six, six for 5. It's called Species Gorger. I kept this one in 
from the old version of the deck. Uh, that video is no longer up. Um, but Species Gorger says, at the beginning of your upkeep, you return a creature you control to its owner's hand. You're probably going to cascade into this instead of casting it. Um, worst case scenario, it gets out and you have to bounce it. Best case scenario, you cascade into it, and on your next turn, you will bounce Maelstrom Wanderer to your hand so that you can cast it again without the commander tax. So, that's what this is in here for. It's a really niche card, even in this deck. Um, there's better ways to do this, but I like Species Gorger the best for some reason. It's a frog beast, it's a 6-6, six, six, and it costs 5. I just like it. Next up, we got Jurta Ancient. Um, this is a fun group card. Um, it's a 7 5 for 5. Whenever a player taps a land for mana, that player adds one mana to their mana pool of any type that land produced. So, uh, doubles everyone's mana. It's a mana flare on a big, beady stick. Um, it enables you, it enables your opponents. It's a fun card to play. They just have to deal with the 7 5 without killing it. Dragon Mage is a 5-5 flyer for 7, and whenever it deals combat damage to an opponent, you get a free Wheel of Fortune, uh, whether you want it or not. Uh, so this deck, sort of keeping up with the not knowing what's going to happen, you could even not know what's going to happen in your hand. Deluvian Primordial, it's a flyer for 5-5, five five. it's the blue Primordial. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent gets a instant or sorcery out of their, out of their, or you get an instant or sorcery out of each opponent's graveyard, and you get to cast those instants slash sorceries if you want to. And when those cards would be put into a graveyard, this way uh, you exile them instead. So, uh, super fun, pretty straightforward, standard blue stuff for Commander. Same deal, Rhystic Study. It's Rhystic Study. Pretty much every blue deck is playing it. Uh, it gives you card advantage for basically free. Uh, it'll draw you a little bit of hate, but with this deck, most people are just kind of happy to let you draw the card. Uh, there are a couple clone effects in here. This is one of them because everyone else is going to be getting some advantage off of you. Also, it's fun to have like six or seven uh, World Spine Worms, Avengers of Zendikar, Blightsteel Colossi, whatever you want. Anyway, this one has Flash, um, and it's a really straightforward clone effect. It has the same cost, same enter the battlefield deal, comes in as a copy of any creature in play. This is another clone. It's Dax Duplicate. It's clone, but it has red in its mana cost, and it has haste into throne. Eternal Witness, uh, to get stuff out of your graveyard. Uh, this really doesn't get abused very much, unless maybe with Species Gorger or something like that. Uh, but Eternal Witness is Eternal Witness. You don't want to be caught without Eternal Witness. Progenitor Mimic is another clone. Uh, enters the battlefield as a copy of any creature in play, and it gains at the beginning of your upkeep. If this creature isn't a token, put a token onto the battlefield that's a copy of this creature. You can make a clock with this. Um, if you start playing with uh, this as a Progenitor Mimic, or, I'm sorry, Progenitor Mimic as a Blightsteel Colossus or as an Avenger of Zendikar. Uh, it just creates a clock for your opponents. As soon as you get up enough power to swing at all of them and get through, you win. Uh, so it's something that they have to deal with. Trigon Predator. Uh, it's a 2-3 with flying. It's for one, a green, and a blue. It's one of the more disappointing cards in here, but at the same time, it's a really great utility creature because whenever it deals combat damage to a player, you destroy target artifact or enchantment that player controls. So it's a great way to deal with some permanents in a deck that doesn't really have a whole lot of removal because there isn't much room for it. Speaking of which, here's Phyrexian Ingester. Um, it is a blue duplicate that gets bigger than whatever you exile with it. Molten Primordial is the red Primordial. It uh, zealous conscripts each opponent for a creature when it enters the battlefield. Gives them haste. Pretty neat. Shaman of the Great Hunt draws you a bunch of cards. Has haste. It's a 4-2. Uh, whenever a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, put a 1-1 counter on it so it incentivizes some combat, which is primarily how this deck's going to win. And for 2 and 2 Simic Hybrid, you draw a card for each creature you control with power 4 or greater. Which is often quite a few. Seasons Past is a super overlooked card from Shadows Over Innistrad, a very nice green sorcery. You return any number of cards with different converted mana costs from your graveyard to your hand, and then you put Seasons Past on the bottom of its owner's library. Um, super good Eternal Witness for, you know, a, an untold number of things. I'm pretty sure the cap, the number of things you could possibly get with this is like 12 or 13 or 14. Either way, 6 mana to get a bunch of stuff back is not bad. 
Harmonize, draw some cards, nice to cascade into. Frost Titan for dealing with some problem creatures on your opponent's side, especially if they have a blocker in the way that you just cannot get past. Zealous Conscripts for stealing things from your opponent for a turn. Destructive Revelry for dealing with artifacts and enchantments. Mystic Retrieval for getting the fun stuff back. Jory N. Ruin Diver. Um, pretty much straight card advantage. Early game draw is pretty nice. Um, yeah, I, there's really not a whole lot to say about Jory N. She's, uh, she's pretty great. She's a pretty mediocre commander. There's better commanders in these two colors because she doesn't really do anything. Um, but especially in a deck where you're cascading and you're gonna, I mean, with Maelstrom Monitor, you're guaranteed to cast three things, so might as well draw a card for him. Then we have the one Planeswalker in the deck is Xenagos the Reveler. Uh, he's in here for his plus one and his minus six, because his minus six uh, is basically a Sea of the Unwritten. Um, and his plus one can give you a ton of mana, which enables your deck to go further and do crazier things. And the last card in the deck is Cyclonic Rift. Yeah, I am not without board wipes. Uh, Apocalypse is not my only answer. I needed something else, and Cyclonic Rift just seemed to fit. Uh, worst case scenario, you cascade into it, and you have to bounce something you don't control. So, uh, you're not going to bounce your Maelstrom Wanderer with it, but absolute minimum, you're going to take care of a problem permanent. And really, it's free if you do that. So, how bad could it be? And anyway... That is the Maelstrom Wanderer deck that I have been playing with for quite some time now. It is a ton of fun. It's become a fan favorite. A lot of people love playing with it. I lend it out a lot. Uh, a lot of people like to try it out for themselves. Um, and just overall, it's a great deck. It's a lot of fun. I would highly recommend it to somebody who knows their way around the stack um, and also is just sort of looking to... I don't want to say nerf themselves... But it's a deck that you don't really have a whole lot of control over, and it brings back some of the, your earlier experiences with Commander, where you were just sort of playing Battle Cruiser. Because I've noticed a lot of people sort of get better at Magic, and they build better decks, and they just keep escalating and escalating and escalating. And that definitely happened to me in my playgroup. And this deck sort of reminded us of where we came from and what we loved most about Commander, and that's all the huge, hilarious, stupid stuff that you get to do uh, with these cards in this game that in any other format, you just can't do it. Um, so that is the Maelstrom Wanderer, and I will be back shortly with hopefully several other deck techs. I have gotten quite a few decks built in the time that I've been away, and I want to show all of them to everyone. <laughs>